webinar titled The New Normal, Navigating COVID-19. My name is Frank Musica, and I am one of three risk management professionals in the Education and Practice Management Program at Victor. As the nation's leading provider of professional liability insurance for design firms, we want to share with you some of the exposure and coverage issues we see in what might be considered the new normal for the design and construction industry. And we want you to share some of your concerns and your practice management challenges. So you will see a chat box on your screen, and you are welcome to type in a question. We hope that we will cover most of your issues in our presentation, but we will have time near the end of the webinar and after the webinar to respond as best we can. I do want to apologize in advance for any glitches we might have in conducting this program and for the less than perfect sound quality. As you are, we are operating remotely, so trying to coordinate five speakers can be a challenge. So, folks, uh, I apologize that uh, this is the home gateway. For some reason, uh, um, I don't think Frank's uh, audio is coming through. Thank you. Let's try it again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> we are having glitches. Okay. Welcome to our webinar titled The New Normal, Navigating COVID-19. My name is Frank Musica, and I am one of three risk management professionals in the education and practice management program at Victor. As the nation's leading provider of professional liability insurance for design firms, we want to share with you some of the exposure and coverage issues we see in what might be considered the new normal for the design and construction industry. And we want you to share some of your concerns and your practice management challenges. So you will see a chat box on your screen and you are welcome to type in a question. We hope we will cover most of your issues in our presentation, that we will have time near the end of the webinar and after the webinar to respond as best we can. I do want to apologize in advance for, for the glitches um, we have in conducting this program and for the less than perfect sound quality. As you are, we are operating remotely, so trying to coordinate five speakers can be a challenge. Um, this program is registered with the continuing education system of the American Institute of Architects. It is a one learning unit program. Because of the AICS requirements, we will run through the mandatory AI slides. After this webinar, you will receive a survey. If you identified your firm as a policyholder, your survey will include information on our reporting of your participation to the AICS office. We uh, can also provide you with a certificate so you can self-report your involvement in this webinar. If you are not a policyholder, you will receive a survey 
that we cannot provide you with a continuing education credit or a certificate unless you pay a filing fee of $50. We hope you value the education, but if you want the documentation of your involvement, we will need to offset our costs. We do want everyone to complete the survey since you can provide us with information on the value of our efforts. Note that this slide lists all five of our speakers. With me through remote hookups are Kevin Collins. Kevin is head of our professional liability insurance program for design firms and contractors. He has over three decades of working with firms like yours to develop responsive coverage. In addition, we have Nahum Gabriel, who is a professional engineer as well as an attorney and is one of my colleagues in risk management. We will also hear from Yvonne Castillo, who heads the risk management department and who will dis discuss some of the federal programs that we are all counting on to preserve your ability to survive this pandemic. And during the program, we will call on Mary Husway, one of our senior underwriters with decades of experience helping firms like yours face the exigencies caused by disasters, including pandemics. She will provide the underwriter's perspective on how we can help you. Uh, Frank, I think you've gone mute again. At the resources slide. Okay, I have no idea why this is happening. It, it's just this at the resources slide. So you, yeah, we heard you. Okay. Open. Yeah. So okay, so let's talk about the resources slide. So over seven years ago, we or seven weeks ago, we came out with a blog post to help guide uh, firms. Any firm insured or not can access our blog at the URL. There are now five blog posts addressing pandemic issues and directing readers to resources, and a sixth will be added shortly. And I wanna make sure you know we have another webinar scheduled for April 28th. Uh, you might have a version of the handout that says it's in August, but it is in April, less than a week from now. It is a 90-minute program that features Kent Stare and some of his colleagues at the law firm of Coastal Spirit Stair, Kingma, and Lovell in Charleston, Atlanta. Go to our website and register for that program. It will reinforce what we say today and add more information to help you maneuver safely through your contractual obligations. Before we go to the next slide that discusses the topics we will address today, I want to turn over the program to Kevin Collins, who wants to update you on our efforts to enable you to continue your practice and facilitate your ability to survive this new normal. Kevin? Thanks, Frank, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, most people, West Coast, good morning. Um, first of all, I wanted to say on behalf of Victor um, and everybody here, um, just that we hope that everybody's doing well in this new environment and is everybody safe. Uh, we're definitely in a, a different environment, whether it's a work from home or just the element of how construction is being faced at the state level and, and how firms are, are operating. And we're hoping to be able to share effectively some good information uh, that you can bring back to your firm or engage in your practice um, today. And then obviously, as we continue the conversation next week, continuing to bring in some experts to deal uh, with deeper dive issues that we could do. Um, but again, thank you for joining. Uh, we're looking forward to providing you with a lot of information in a short period of time. Frank? Thank you, Kevin. Now let's look at the topics. Here are the topics we will address. I will start by discussing some project management issues. If you read our blog post, you know that we emphasize that you understand your contractual obligations, discuss your services with your clients, and document any redefinition of your services. I want to explain to you a difference between what you do and what a contractor does, and this is reflected in the contracts. Here are the provisions in the B101 and A201. There is no force majeure provision in the AIA or Engineers Joint Contract Documents Committee 
standard professional services documents. Since 1963, we have had a seat on the AIA contract documents committee. I am currently the Professional Liability Insurance Council, and I can tell you that with each revision, adding a provision uh, is discussed. Often trying to incorporate the federal contract language that includes, among other forces, quarantines and epidemics. But this is all that is currently included, the term except for reasonable cause. Now, there will be, probably be lawsuits interpreting that in the light of government restrictions. Does it mean impossibility of performance, or is it a lesser standard? Note the contractor has a much better provision. The contractor is just a business entity, not a professional. Once it signs a contract to deliver the project, the contractor is given opportunities to recoup its expenses and require additional time or money to complete the project when outside influences disrupt the contractor's efforts. Although contractors and the Associated General Contractors of America will complain, and AGC will use its lobbying power to make sure federal legislation benefits contractors and state regulations keep contractors working, most contractors are likely to prosper during the uh, pandemic. Construction workers might suffer either from COVID-19 or unemployment, but construction companies are in good shape. That is because any change in conditions that affect the contractual obligations will lead to more money for them and relieve them from meeting the timely delivery of a project. One of the delays that might happen on a project that can lead to a claim is a disruption in the supply chain. For instance, you might have specified LED lighting that has components produced in China. Um, because of the problems in China, they might not be available on time for the scheduled installation causing a project delay. Chances are that that will lead to a claim against the owner um, for more time or more money, and uh, the owner might bring a claim against you for negligently specifying the luminaires. Um, you know, that's the kind of claim that you may see coming. A claim is probably easy to fight off, but be aware that it may come your way. And many claims against design firms result because of contractor claims against the project owner. When contractors get paid more, project owners look for cost recovery. And design firms often are the target of the effort. Here are some of the ways the owner will use to extract funding from the design firm. So please, uh, be make, please make sure that you are communicating with the client to try to head off some of these owner claims. Uh, keep this hot slide handy. Uh, discuss your role with the project with the client and document the owner's agreement to any modifications in your services. For instance, you cannot um, meet the contractual obligations to certify substantial completion uh, in, as it is defined in a normal contract because doing so requires you to physically inspect the project and you may not be able to do so. That, a change such as that has to be properly documented. And just as a contractor would be paid for any additional cost it encounters to keep the project going, changes in material prices, additional safety measures, and just about any other cost are going to be passed on by the contractor to the owner, you should attempt to be in that position too. You are providing services to the project owner for the project owner's benefit. So don't give away your services or incur costs that should be those of the project owner in getting the capital asset put in place. Note, you might have additional services to suspend the project and then to reactivate the project later on. Get paid for those services. And when you see this, we're all in this together spirit, please remember that right now, lawyers are already preparing claims and we will see contractors bringing significant legal actions as soon as that spirit wanes. Uh, your firm might be providing services you would not provide but for the pandemic. You might be volunteering your services or you might be using your expertise to help set up temporary medical facilities. Do not go beyond your expertise because unless there are immunity statutes on which you can rely, you can be the target of claims from grateful but harmed clients who do not pay for your services. 
it is extremely important that you get a written contract that not, not only specifies your roles and responsibilities, but also provides a waiver of any liability that could be imposed on you and indemnification for you in the event of any harm you might incur or claims by any third parties against you. Now, the home and I will discuss some of the people management issues. Uh, we cannot provide you with information on how to do it, but we can discuss some of the liability issues. I will start with the remote working issue. You will be faced with communication challenges, not only within your firm, but also with others, uh, including your subconsultants. Again, communications and cooperation are essential, but documentation is absolutely critical. In addition, share that documentation so everyone knows what the recommendations and decisions uh, that were made. Don't forget your quality assurance, quality control processes. You might have to change how they are conducted to accommodate the remote workforce. If you do, please make sure you document how the quality process will work on each specific project. There is nothing worse than having a contractor or a project client have you identify what your normal QA, QC process is, and then ask you why you did not follow it on that project. It immediately destroys your credibility as a professional. So if it has to be changed, change it and document that change. And realize right now that there's major cyber liability issues. Hackers are exploiting the work from home situation. Now, you probably have some form of cyber liability co insurance coverage. If you do not, you should. Uh, but you should know that, you know, what that policy specifically covers and know how well your systems work to keep intruders out. Uh, one of the common current attacks on design firms is, is to threaten that something has been changed in the design or the design deliverables and to require ransom to have it divulged with your only other options to paying the ransom being ignoring a threat and possibly causing a major problem later, or checking everything you have done since the beginning of the project to make sure nothing has been changed. So you probably have rules in place on how employees are supposed to use email and other systems. Please reinforce um, the, those procedures and make sure uh, that you're minimizing the possibility of hackers coming into your program. Uh, and remember, you are a business and you owe your employees certain duties. You have to avoid a hostile work environment and that can mean forcing employees to put themselves in perceived danger. And, you have, and if you have to terminate the employment of some staff members, have a valid reason, such as financial stress for your firm, to do so. Do not use the pandemic to justify, for instance, getting highly paid boomers out of your firm. You will get an age discrimination claim. Now, you probably have employment practices liability insurance that will cover that, but it is a messy uh, situation to be in. If you find out, by the way, that um, one of your former employees might have been exposed to COVID-19 while employed, you probably do not have a legal duty to warn them, but you might consider it your moral duty. Currently, the OSHA and CDC guidance uh, is that an employer should notify others when exposure has occurred, but you probably do not know if the exposure of the former employee occurred during the employment period. The home will talk later about using replacements for on-staff, uh, on-site activities. But keep in mind that when you sign a professional services contract, you might not be able to subcontract without the owner's or perhaps the lender's approval. And you might run the foul state registration laws in doing so or violate other state reg regulations. If you are short staffed because of illnesses or need to cut your overhead, be careful about using independent consultants in the design or construction phases. You might hire a subcontractor who is not adequately insured and violate your contract by doing so. And understand that while your policy covers your vicarious liability for harm caused by the professional negligence of an independent subcontractor, 
it does not cover that outside subcontractor, that temp, uh, as your contract might require. Now, there are some options, and Mary, uh, could you discuss a little bit about options of insuring a non-insured subcontractor or temporary worker so that a firm can, can comply with its contractual obligation? Sure, Frank. Um, one of the things that, that we have and we've been asked for in the past, so it's not new that it is a solution strictly for COVID-19, but if in fact you do hire a subcontractor or you hire a specialist who is not an insured that wants to be covered under your policy, we can certainly issue an endorsement that would name that individual for services provided to you, and it can even be be brought down to a specific project. In the ideal world, of course, we would hope that any of your subs or people that you contract with would carry their own coverage. But if not, we do be we are able to provide a solution for you in an endorsement form. Thank you, Mary. Sure. Okay, let's Nahum and I will talk about your obligation to provide a safe workplace. You know, you have to always meet the OSHA general duty requirements and any OSHA guidelines specific now to the pandemic. OSHA has said it's not going to be out there strictly enforcing its new rules, but if you vary from them, you could be liable to your employees or others harmed by your employees violating OSHA rules. Here are some of the concerns. That last um, bullet item is a good transition to the home we'll be talking about construction phase services. You have always had to provide the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, hard hat, glasses, appropriate shoes, and now you will have to do more, including, of course, meeting the specific requirements put in place by the contractor, who by contract has control of the site. And uh, Nahom, uh, why don't you follow up and tell us a, a little bit about construction phase issues? Thank you, Frank. And really, uh, some of these issues that Frank is raising um, are part of the challenges that you all have in trying to address your contractual obligations during the construction phase to your owner. Um, so what I'll be talking about are some of the issues uh, related to site visits. How do you go about maintaining your contractual obligations to your client uh, in a time when travel is often restricted and uh, although as Yvonne will point out construction has been deemed to be essential getting to and fro from the site is certainly a challenge and, and you, you need to take special measures to make sure that your folks understand that and I'll talk about that. And as Frank pointed out, performance issues by the contractor are going to be a big deal of contention between the owner and the contractor. And you as a trusted advisor to the, to the uh, client certainly have a role to play to make sure that the owner is indeed protecting their interests and is asking the right questions of the contractor who will be alleging um, a delay, uh, certainly delay and a, a, probably additional costs as well as Frank alluded to. And then finally, we've already started seeing questions from firms that are being asked to step up into a role of a building official. Uh, these counties and municipalities certainly don't have the same capacity to process the, the uh, paperwork that they used to, uh, and, and folks are being asked to step into that role um, during construction. So. Uh, that's also a question that has come up uh, working with our friends. So we'll be uh, talking about that as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Frank. So the question becomes, uh, how do you perform your construction contract administration visits? Obviously, as originally contemplated in any current contract that you have, it was assumed that you would be on site, uh, probably on a regular basis, to so keep tabs on what is going on. Uh, that's a fairly important uh, duty that you have, and the owner certainly wants to know that what's being done is uh, adequate, and before they 
pay the, on that payout, they want to make sure that you, the design professional, have looked at it. So how do we do that um, in an age where, uh, in a new world where folks are not that keen to go out on site? Um, if your client is willing to address it and if you think it can serve their needs, you can certainly ask for an amendment of your scope of services to see if you can rely on video or photographic uh, information that is provided to you by the contractor. Obviously, that assumes that you have a decent working relationship with the contractor and that you're willing, <coughs> excuse me, to rely on that information and, and make the necessary calls uh, to call it uh, to represent the owner's needs at that point. Obviously, the owner would have to agree to that. Uh, not all, all owners are amenable uh, to that uh, proposition. We have had one insured actually reach out to us and say that the owner is requiring that we go out on site, and these are all rural sites all over the state, uh, and uh, we just don't see the need right now to have to do that, but the owner was insisting on their contractual rights. So obviously, that's, that's it. those are the types of challenging situations that uh, you'd have to work your way through, but knowing what your contract is and being able to rely on, the, uh, on what your obligations are is the first step in any, uh, in any uh, negotiation uh, with your client. But if indeed you do need to make site visits, then as Frank kind of skipped over it in the earlier slide, you have to provide personal uh, protective uh, equipment to that uh, to your employees, uh, just like you would provide them with hard hats and steel toe boots to go out on construction site. That is indeed uh, something you'd have to provide to your folks to make sure that they are uh, they have the necessary equipment. As an employer, you probably need to, not just probably, you do need to provide resources to your folks so that they understand what the social distancing guidelines are as far as the CDC has put them out there. Uh, it's um, what does it your employee do, for example, if they're in a confined space and they happen to run uh, across the site uh, superintendent who wants to actually ask you a question? Uh, how do you deal with those situations uh, if you happen to be on site. Your employees need to have the awareness to be able to protect themselves from those types of exposures because they need to be prepared for that. Um, and obviously there are some logistical uh, challenges that have to be addressed in this new age. Um, you need to contact the contractor before showing up. I think that makes sense, especially now. Uh, and ask them, what are your protocols that you, contractor, have in place, and how do we go about me being on site? Obviously, you're, they're not conducting the same uh, monthly meeting updates that you may have uh, attended in the past, uh, and, but still, if you are on site, you need to work with the, whoever your contact person is to make sure that uh, measures are in place to greet you accordingly and you're afforded the access that you need. Um, and finally, as an employer, um, you know, Yvonne will talk about this in the next section, but, you know, construction has been deemed essential in virtually all of the states except for some exceptions, but you probably do need to think about issuing a letter to your employee about uh, identifying them as a, a, an employee of your firm and that they are services are deemed essential and that they're authorized by their employer to go out there on site in case they are asked to provide that by uh, the authorities. So uh, those are the things that the practical challenges that would have to be addressed as far as being able to do site visits and meeting your contractual obligations. Now, the more challenging questions are, are the staff willing to go to the site? Um, and then, uh, you know, as an employer, how do you decide who goes? Um, is it, do you select the young, able-bodied uh, folks who, uh, who are deemed to be less at risk, although the evidence on that is still developing? Is that exposing yourself to a hostile work environment uh, claim, as Frank alluded to? Uh, what about the folks who you're choosing not to send out? Uh, 
uh, is that are you inhibiting them from uh, job opportunities that they otherwise seek? Um, obviously, all of these are uh, questions that uh, law students are going to ruminate over in the next few months, assuming they can go back to school. But these are real practical issues that you as an employer would have to decide as to how you deal with your folks and how you communicate that. I think one thing that employees would appreciate uh, most is a sense of transparency and honesty as to how these uh, roles are being divided up. Uh, and then the other issue, of course, is that especially if you're in an out-of-state type uh, environment where you're obligated to travel somewhere, can you replace that employee with contracted uh, individuals? That assumes, obviously, that you have such a network that you have firms available that you can tap into, seek if they were willing to take that on, um, or individuals, as Frank and Mary just uh, discussed. Uh, obviously, um, you also have to check with your contract to make sure that the client is, uh, that you don't need to seek the approval of your client to uh, engage somebody else to do these types of services. Uh, these, again, are challenges that I think will come more and more uh, to the fore. Um, obviously, uh, we're still working our way through it. Um, to what extent this will become the new normal would, become, would I guess, depend on where exactly you are. And, and, and Ron will talk about the uh, uh, latest developments in that front uh, as she sees them. Next slide, please, Frank. <clears throat> so the more challenging issue between the owner and the contractor is going to be, well, yes, it is an excusable delay, uh, uh, and w but what does the construction contract say? And as, as Frank uh, stated earlier, the federal acquisition regulations actually say that uh, uh, in its list of excusable delays, specifically includes epidemics and quarantine restrictions. So knowing that, um, you know that um, you, these types of claims are gonna be coming down. And you as the advisor to the client really can show your value to, the, to your client by helping them ask the right questions so that you all can get on the same page, you all being the owner and the contractor, about what their real exposures are and what the challenges are. Ideally, in order to be able to do this, your, the construction contract calls on the contractor to provide you with a schedule. Uh, those schedules have been updated regularly and you've reviewed them and you kind of know where they are in the scheme of things and what their expected completion data is. Uh, ideally, you also have a schedule of values that has been submitted as part of the construction contract uh, requirements that the contractor has, and we have access to that, and you can evaluate what they were expecting to uh, charge the client for the construction. Um, obviously, uh, you know, when you look at these, the exposure the contractor has, the three things you look at are labor, equipment, and material. Clearly, labor is going to be, uh, productivity is going to be affected. Um, the workers, especially if the contractor has put in place social distancing protocols, there are going to be productivity hits, uh, uh, and, and that, that is to be expected. Um, but the equipment and material uh, impact uh, clearly, uh, especially if you can't be on site and monitor what type of materials or equipment are being used, it's very difficult uh, for you to ascertain that. So one thing that you can assist the owner is to uh, develop a set of questions that the owner can ask of the contractor to flesh out some of these issues so that at least when that claim comes in, you have some baseline on which to uh, state, uh, you know, what the contractor was reporting at the time of, of construction instead of waiting until the end. So these are the list of questions that I uh, thought would be important. Frank? And, and by the way, we first got notice from an insurer that a contractor was 
alleging that they 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 have they're putting the owner on notice uh, for construction uh, in early May. So the contractors, as Frank alluded to, are certainly uh, very much aware of what their uh, uh, rights are under the contract and, and uh, certainly are not shy about uh, uh, notifying the owner uh, about potential delays. Um, one thing that uh, should be thought about is uh, it's not, you know, in this environment, it's not just the contractors, but the subcontractors that the general relies on. Uh, are they still performing? As Frank said, I, I don't think the construction business itself is a really um, suffering right now, but if the owners at some point start uh, not being able to pay, then some of the subs may well be impacted on their ability to show up on other sites uh, and continue working. Um, what, uh, is there any impact on the supply chain due to COVID-19? Uh, what are the, some of the things that uh, uh, you've identified in order to take care of that? Uh, uh, have you identified the second and third tier suppliers uh, and able to engage with them uh, in case there's a breakdown uh, with your tier one suppliers? Um, if from, you, from your point as a design firm, you want to know if these issues are going to uh, mean that they are going to propose uh, substitute products. And if so, do these require design team sign off? Obviously, you are going to be involved in that process. You're going to have to evaluate that and uh, charge additional fees for that uh, for that additional service. So you want to help the client uh, uh, through that process uh, as much as possible. So, so these are some of the questions that you, as a, as a as a design firm, can work with your client to try to get an early read on what the actual exposure is that the owner is being asked to uh, pay for in this new normal. Next, next slide. Then the last thing that we are going to talk about is uh, local government coordination. Uh, clearly, local government operations are affected, and like us, uh, a lot of them are working from home. Uh, and in some cases, the uh, Government, government, uh, the governor's executive orders specifically state that the uh, uh, the code uh, officials can rely on the design firms to fulfill uh, a certification of code compliance. Uh, and if you're getting these types of requests, I think the first thing you need to do is exactly what legal authority does the local government official have to make such demands. If it is just a local county official spreading your weight around and there isn't much uh, authority behind it, then uh, your response would be very different if, if this is something that is indeed required or asked of uh, design firms. The challenge you have in these situations is that uh, certifying code compliance is really a ministerial act by a state official. Um, and typically that is not something that would be done by a design firm unless you're specifically contracted for those types of services. So it does open you up to uh, claims. Um, obviously, what you know, firms, insurance companies, and your attorneys would say is, do you have sovereign immunity protection for stepping into this role? Um, and is, are there any uh, limitations to the claims that may be brought up against you? If you have the ability to claim sovereign immunity, I think a lot of this exposure uh, could be controlled in a meaningful way. If you do not, or if it is not apparent that you have these types of protections, then the best way to deal with these would be through your lo local uh, professional societies, uh, assuming that your government representatives are answering those, their phone calls. Um, and then finally, obviously, this is still an additional service, right? Uh, so you need to be thinking about increased fees. You need to educate your client. Um, and if assuming that the client is still a viable business entity in a few years, then certainly a waiver of claims and a defense and indemnity uh, clause from your client to you uh, could be a meaningful uh, protection. One last thing that I uh, would like to say is that in this time, uh, as Frank alluded to, there's a lot of good feelings uh, right now. 
um, and, and people are willing to work with each other, but you know, as things start going back to normal, you should be cognizant of what your uh, contractual obligations are and make sure that docu you document any uh, mutual decisions you make with your client. Uh, finally, if your client says, hey, we're gonna take away your uh, construction phase administration uh, re uh, responsibilities, then obviously at that point, uh, uh, that, that you need to be aware of if there are any requirements that you notify your local building officials that uh, you do not have construction administration services. Uh, some states require that, that you notify them, and, and the owner has to be put on notice that they need to engage somebody else if they decide to take away this uh, uh, phase from you. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Ron to go about uh, discussing some of the uh, uh, regulatory, uh, for some of the relief uh, that the government is providing for businesses such as yours. Thanks, Naum. Appreciate it. And thanks, Frank. Um, so uh, I'm going to go rather quickly. Um, but as you all know, yep, thank, next slide. As you all know, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, was passed and signed into law in late March, March 27th, effective April 3rd. It contained $376 billion in relief for American workers and small businesses. And the act expanded the traditional SBA funding programs and was the third piece of legislation in a package of federal relief policies to address the pandemic. I'm gonna, because of uh, time constraints, I'm gonna touch on two new programs, the temporary programs. Um, the bad news is, as, as many of you all know, last Thursday, April 16th, within 13 days of the act's effective date, the federal government actually ran out of money for the programs. So one of the reasons, um, although there are many reasons, one of the reasons the money was drained so fast was uh, the way the legislation was written that exempted franchises, uh, which enabled franchises to apply, uh, which drained the, the source of funding quickly. So really, really large businesses were applying far in excess of the number, the 500 employees uh, limit. Um, so yeah, so the fund is effectively uh, emptied at the moment. However, we still need to talk about it because there's good news as you all are, I'm sure are watching on TV or reading in the papers, the funds are gonna be replenished. Um, interim legislation actually passed the Senate yesterday. Uh, Congress was set to vote um, in affirmatively uh, by consensus today, but it looks like that's been moved to Thursday. So tomorrow um, it appears, uh, that through all my resources or all my sources, um, it will be um, approved by Congress. Uh, there's, it seems there is consensus mostly. Um, and as soon as it hits the president's desk, let's say um, Friday or late Thursday, I don't really know exactly what that time frame will look like, but probably this week, um, the president will likely sign it. He's already expressed um, support of the legislation. Um, and we're also looking at another fourth package of legislation uh, for infrastructure funding. Um, that package isn't likely to get any real traction until late May or June, um, but um, it's you know something we want to keep an eye on, um, and uh, we'll we'll be reporting and updating you on that soon. So let's quickly touch on the two programs that offer relief to businesses. Um, there are two, uh, as I said, in the CARES Act, but due to time constraints, we're going to just focus on the two. Uh, I mean, there are many. The Paycheck Protection Program and the Emergency Grants are the two. Um, please know uh, that these two programs are not an either-or proposition. When funds are replenished, hopefully in the next week, if your needs match the programs, you can apply for both as long as you're using the funds for the intended purpose. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a second. But just keep in mind that one of the programs, the Paycheck Protection Program, that's to be used for payroll, payroll, rent, utilities, transportation expenses. The other program I'll talk about in a moment um, is to be used for general bills, supplies, and other expenses outside of the payroll uh, purview. Uh, so this, you can stay on this slide, um, Frank. So what is the Paycheck Protection? Nope, sorry, go back, please. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so what is the Paycheck Protection Program? Um, 
It was originally funded at $349 billion. This program is an expansion, expansion, as I mentioned, of the traditional SBA 7A loan program. It's best suited for businesses that are, that are primarily struggling to make payroll or retain staff. The loans can be up to uh, for up to $10 million, but the actual loan amount, the way it's calculated, is by essentially multiplying your business's average monthly payroll in 2019 by 2.5. So essentially you get average monthly payroll for two and a half months from the government. That's the, the actual loan amount you could qualify for. Now, once your loan is received, let's say you apply, you get your money, that's when an eight week countdown begins. And during that first eight weeks, you've got the funds in hand post loan, uh, payments will be made um, as, you, as you make payments on payroll, rent, utility, mortgage interest, that stuff. Um, those um, those expenses may be forgiven, um, and it no longer becomes a loan. It's literally a grant from the federal government. Um, there are some conditions, of course. Um, we're not your accountant, so you certainly need to read it, but at a high level, you have to keep all of your employees on the payroll, um, or let's just say in the last few weeks, you've laid off some people or you've put them in a part-time position. As long as by June 30th, you rehire those people, put those people back at a, in a full-time uh, role within your firm, if you apply for this loan and you're using that money to pay those people, you will get, uh, that, that loan will be forgiven, okay? Um, the second piece to that is, you should know that while 75% of whatever that borrowed money is, borrowed in, in quotes, um, it must be used for payroll, including salaries, vacation, leave, retirement benefits, health coverage, and then the other 25% can be used on rent, mortgage interest, insurance premiums, utilities. Okay, so there is somewhat of a divvying up. Um, in other words, the vast majority of the money that you get out of this, this loan has to be used for payroll. Of course, the legislative intent behind that is they want to keep people employed. Um, there is an opportunity for partial forgiveness if your headcount or wages decrease, but you'll have to look at the guidelines and calculate that. Uh, you know, work with your accountant or just look at the guidelines. Absolute worst case scenario, if you don't get the loan forgiven, and I hope that's not the case for any of you because I know you want to pay your employees, you will have two years to pay it off at 1% interest rate, which is a phenomenal interest rate, with the first payment being deferred for six months. There are no personal guarantees required to qualify for this. Um, again, hopefully that's not the case. Um, so next slide, please. So to apply for the loan, um, as I mentioned, um, applications have to be submitted by June 30th, even though they're uh, going through, uh, they're passing some interim uh, supplemental legislation to replenish the fund. I have not seen anything to change that deadline. So it looks like it is still a June 30th deadline. So we have a little over two months to apply. I wouldn't wait. Um, I would keep a very close eye on what's happening in the next couple of days. In fact, I would be uh, preparing your application now. Um, and as you see there on the bullet, um, you need to be working with a participating lender. Um, I've been reading the news. It appears that local lenders seem to be having uh, more success. The larger lenders have been overwhelmed with applications. So you'll have to check with your local lender to see if they're participating in the program. But uh, purportedly, the process is very simple. You're just going to contact uh, your lender or your local lender, apply for the loan. They have the application. You can get the application if you want on your own and get started through at the SBA website. Once you are approved for the loan, you'll sign the note with the lender. And then once you get the money, the SBA is going to be paid or is going to be paying the lender back directly. You won't have to assume payments on any of that. Next slide, please. So the next program I uh, just really quickly want to touch on is the economic injury disaster loan. Um, can advance to the next uh, slide, please. Oh, there he is. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Frank, got it, yep, there you go. Um, okay, uh, this is just another SBA program, uh, and um, like the Paycheck Protection Program, the funds for this program were depleted um, 13 days after it became effective. Um, what I'm seeing is the, the Paycheck Protection Program Increase Act of 2020, that's the one that's pending right now, um, appears to be doubling the authorization level for these grants. 
um, from 10 billion all the way up to 20 billion. So huge uh, supplement of appropriated funds coming soon. Um, when the CARES Act passed in late March, in addition to the Paycheck Protection Program, this particular grant pro program expanded the emergency grant program that existed to include ESOPs with fewer than 500 employees, including also including sole proprietors and independent contractors. And the purpose of this program is for firms who need a quick infusion of cash to help cover costs and expenses other than payroll. Um, it does have a cap of $10,000 uh, for firms with 10 or greater employees, or for firms with 10 or fewer employees, the cap is decreased by 1,000 for each employee. So for example, uh, for each employee under 10. So for example, if you're a firm of eight employees, your cap is gonna be at 8,000. So unlike the Paycheck Protection Program that we talked about, this is, a, this is structured as a grant. So there's no prerequisite requirements needed to trigger repayment. Um, notably, the law does require a three-day disbursement uh, turnaround once you're approved, but as you know, there have been some glitches and some reported backlogs. Now that the funds are gone, of course, that's an issue, but with the replenishment funds coming very soon, if you are eligible and you have suffered losses due to COVID-19, you should apply. Um, there are no deadlines, by the way, uh, for applying for this program. It goes through 2020. But again, as we saw in that first round, uh, funds were depleted in 13 days. So my recommendation is you get that application ready to go. This is one that you can apply directly through the SBA. So you can hit send as soon as the funds are there. Um, so um, again, due to time constraints, I'm not gonna be able to focus on the other parts of the CARES Act, but there are some really important pieces to that related to payroll tax credits, employee retention uh, credits, the federal sick and family leave credit, unemployment benefits. Um, ultimately, if your firm has a CFO, you're gonna to wanna to strategize with her or him to develop a strategy for optimizing these programs for your firm's need, needs. But keep in mind, these, you know, these are temporary programs and uh, thinking beyond them, uh, the relief programs uh, would be a really good move. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna move on real quickly to other COVID-related news. As you, we all know, millions of Americans under stay-at-home orders and many governors and other authorities across the nation are allowing essential businesses to stay open and um, construction is one of those. Um, the image that's on this slide, you're seeing from www.builderonline.com and it tracks which states classify construction and building material suppliers as essential. This screenshot was something I did on Monday. You can see that there are a handful of states, including Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Vermont, where construction has been deemed non-essential with project type exceptions for public infrastructure, housing, and healthcare. Since I did this screenshot on Monday, there have been changes. So now Vermont is allowing limited construction operations to proceed and Pennsylvania is targeting May 8th in a couple of weeks as the date construction activity may resume. Um, of course, with um, pretty strict limitations from what I can tell. Uh, you may want to bookmark this tracker map. I think it's really good. I've been checking it frequently throughout the day on developments because things are very fluid and changing um, sometimes hourly, sometimes daily. Next slide, please. Um, there's another good source, um, similar to what you just saw on the previous slide through Construct Connect, www.constructconnect. If you go to that website, you'll see um, a construction activity report related to COVID-19. It's also very valuable, slightly different. Um, one of the aspects of that um, website and report is the delayed projects piece. Um, you'll see, I didn't take a picture of that because uh, the map is interactive, so it's not valuable unless you're live and uh, hovering over the states. Uh, but it, it's, um, it will tell you not only um, essential construction updates, but also delayed projects and essential job updates. Um, the interactive map changes literally every day, and it, um, it will give you specific information and a deep dive into what's happening within each state. On average, I've been checking it for the last couple of weeks and on average I've seen increases on the total number of nationwide delayed projects 60 to 100 projects uh, being added to the list every day 
So for example, this number 3499, that was on Monday, it's now at 3682. Next slide, please. All right, last thing I wanna talk about real quick, and this has sort of been already been uh, talked about through Frank and the Holmes presentation, um, but I think this this uh, survey is interesting and can give you a little bit more context, um, and I'll ex explain further. But um, so back in uh, late March, I think it was March 22nd, I believe, um, the International Code Council surveyed building and fire departments to learn how code officials are coping with professional challenges brought on by COVID-19 pandemic. The survey was about a week and a half uh, period time, so re relatively short, but in that short period of time, they had almost 1,200 responses from uh, 50 U.S. jurisdictions in the District of Columbia. The respondents came from jurisdictions of all sizes, so ranging from 1,000 people to over 4.6 million. So it's a really good, credible snapshot of the activity that's going on, or at least the 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 perspective going on from building and fire officials across the country. The two pieces that I wanted to point out at, at, in terms of trend alerts, the majority of just jurisdictions are still performing inspections at 93%, and the majority of employees are working remotely at 65%. But there are some longer term insights here that could impact you as Nahom and Frank talked about. Their virtual capacity challenges are significant. 40% uh, cannot do electronic plan review, 30% cannot do electronic permitting, and 61 can't do remote inspections. This is their virtual capacity challenges. So thinking through this, if the pandemic stretches into next spring, as we expect, design firms probably are going to see more and more building or requests from building departments to step into this government role and provide this additional service. And as Ninho mentioned earlier, this is a dangerous proposition for your firm. It may be tempting to supplement your services to help clients or, you know, for additional service fees. Uh, but we caution you and advise you to protect your firm with really strong contract language, as Nahom was mentioning, and agreements to extend, extend sovereign immunity. Um, Again, my my colleagues have already said this, but building officials are agents of the government. So when they act and certify, they have the benefit of sovereign immunity. immunity. You don't, um, unless that immunity, immunity is expressly extended to you and your firm. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up now and hopefully take a question or two. But before I do that, um, just wanted to give you a quick update on some uh, resources we have. Um, we've revamped our online presence to enhance our risk management offerings to design firms. What you're seeing here on this screen is a screenshot of our School of Risk Management. This gives you access to not only publications, advisories, and guides specifically for design firms um, to manage project-specific risk and operational risk. You can see that on those two tiles in the middle, managing your project and running your firm tiles. Um, but also, you can see what I really want to point out is on the left side of this screen, you see the tile that says continuing your education. This is our new 24-7 on-demand continuing education platform. It contains almost 40 accredited courses um, with quizzes, all of which are approved for AIA credit. So if you're a member of the AIA, every single one of our courses um, will allow you to get continuing education credit as required as a member of AIA. So every single one of our courses are accredited through the AIA. The vast majority of our courses are also pre-approved for el and eligible, pre-approved as eligible for continuing education by state regulatory entities. So your licensed, uh, your licensing bodies. Um, some states such as New York, California, have some pretty strict limitations. For example, New York statute, um, unfortunately, they define um, their continuing education uh, criteria as excluding, expressly excluding risk management. So unfortunately, we can't help you there. Of course, you still get AIA credit um, if you're an architect in New York State, and it's still great uh, courses for you to embed good risk management practices within your firm. Uh, but New York is somewhat of a problem for us. Um, on that level at least. But I do want to point out that the vast majority of the country's licensing boards for architects, engineers, 
landscape architects, interior designers have pre-approved our courses for credit. So for example, there are 42 state licensing boards that have pre-approved our courses as eligible for continuing education for architects, 27 states for engineers, 34 for landscape architects, and 25 for interior designers. So in addition to the individual courses you would see through in that tile, if you click on that, you're going to find role-based curriculum that were designed specifically for the design firm environment. So we have for example, a curriculum for associates, for project design professionals, program uh, project managers, uh, construction managers. Um, we have all these specific curriculum within that uh, platform for online learning. Um, so anyway, there's much to see. I know I'm touching on that very quickly. But with that, uh, Frank, I'm going to turn it back over to you if you want to see if you can answer some questions. Thank you all. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, yeah, there's a couple questions here that, that I think um, uh, they wanted clarifications. One is, is something that the home mentioned, and, and there's a follow-up question. The question is, state law requires me to continue my services through the contract administration phase for this type of project. What if I cannot do it? And, you know, there could be reasons uh, the contractor won't let you on a site, or the state doesn't think you're essential, or the owner just doesn't want to pay you. Um, there are states and project types where the designer or record has to provide contract administration services. If you cannot, you must notify the permit authority that your um, contract administration scope of services has been limited and provide the reason. You know, otherwise you may violate the law even if you're not breaching your contract with the owner. And uh, a question about the OSHA requirements. Am I going to be fined if I don't meet all of the requirements of the OSHA guidelines? Well, the OSHA and CDC guidelines do not have a force of law, and therefore failure to implement them may not necessarily lead to OSHA penalties. Uh, but there's other more general OSHA liability that, that might be implicated in not following the OSHA or, or CDC guidelines. So even though the COVID-19 OSHA guidance creates no new liability, the general duties clause does impose liability and does require an employer to provide a workplace free from recognized hazards, which are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. So oh, please keep those in mind. And, and I think we have run out of time, so I, I know you might have additional questions. And I ask you to look at the resources out there, including our blog post. Uh, and please fill out the survey, and do not forget to register for the April 28th webinar that will answer many more of your questions. And with that, I thank you.